Good day, everyone. Welcome to the second edition of the Singapore Translation Symposium organized by the Singapore Book Council. Thank you for joining us at our closing panel, Judging Translated Literary Words. I'm, Christian, I'm Christina Ng, your moderator today, and I'm a Singaporean writer, journalist, and literary translator based in Berlin. Some of the Singaporean authors I've translated include Liang Wenfu and Dan Ying. Before we begin, I would like to thank the National Translation Committee for generously supporting the symposium, as well as our venue sponsor, Arts House Limited. I'd also like to thank our program partner, the Commonwealth Foundation. The foundation manages the Commonwealth Short Story Prize, which accepts short stories translated into English from any language. Now, the panel today is about judging translated literature. Our four speakers today will shed light on the judging process as they discuss things like how the merit of translated works is decided, how they ensure the fairness of the judging process, and some common issues that come in the that come up in the judging process. Now there will be a Q&A segment later as well, so please send in your questions via the comments section on the Facebook live page and we will try to get to them later. And now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the speakers for today's session. First, we have Anne Morgan. Hi, Hi. Anne. Hi. 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 Uh, Anne is an author, Royal Literary Fund Advisory Fellow and editor based in Folkestone, UK. In 2012, she set herself the challenge of reading a book from every country in a year, recording her quest at ayearofreadingtheworld.com. This led to a non-fiction book, Reading the World, How I Read a Book from Every Country. Anne continues to blog, write, and speak about international literature, as well as building a career as a novelist. Her debut novel is the international bestseller, Beside Myself, and her second is Crossing Over. Hi, Anne. Hi. Welcome to the panel. Thank you. And now let's get to our second panelist, El Nathan John. Hi, El Nathan. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to meet you too. And El Nathan is a Nigerian lawyer, novelist, voice actor, and satirist. His short stories have been shortlisted twice for the Cannes Prize for African Writing. His novel, Born on a Tuesday, won a Betty Trask Award and was shortlisted for the Nigeria Prize for Literature. It has been translated into German and French. His graphic novel on Ajayi Crowther Street was also published in 2019 and translated into German in 2022 by Avant Verlag under the title Lagos, Leben in Suburbia. El Nathan was on the jury of the 2019 Man Booker International Prize and he lives in Berlin. Pleasure to be here again. Yes, pleasure to meet you. And now we have Karamu Islam, our third panelist. Hi, Karamu. Hi. Hi, nice to see you again. And Karamu is a writer, translator, and editor based in Dhaka, Bangladesh. He was the literary editor of two dailies, Dhaka Tribune and Daily Star, where he encouraged English translations from Bangladesh. He's the director of publishing house Bengal Lights Books, a board member of Dhaka Translation Center, and the editor of the literary journal Bengal Lights. He has published two books of English translations of Bengali short fiction and poems. His short stories have been included in anthologies, and he is a frequent contributor to national and international publications. Welcome, Karimo. Thank you. And now we have our fourth speaker, Ms. Shash Trebed. Hi, Shash. Hi. Hi. It's lovely Hello. to be here. Lovely to meet you too. And Shash is a poet and a translator of Tamil poetry into English. Her poetry has appeared in journals and anthologies, including Poetry, Poetry London, and The North. She has co-edited Out of Sri Lanka, Tamil, Sinhala, and English poetry from Sri Lanka and its diasporas. Shash has been on judging panels for the Pen Translates Awards and the London Book Fair and she was a visible communities translator in residence at the National Centre for Writing. So she is a library critic and is a board member of Modern Poetry in Translation. So I'm going to say a very warm welcome to all our four speakers again today. 
And um, can I perhaps have the, big, the speakers to briefly share with us how they come into literary translation and their experience in judging or reading translated literature? Perhaps we could start with Anne, and um, perhaps you want to talk about your your blog about reading translated literature, but I'll give the floor to you now. Thank you, Christina. Um, yes, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, for me, uh, thinking about judging and reading literature and translation has been uh, a big part of the last 10 years of my life. It began, as Christina explains, with um, a project that took a year uh, in 2012, where I set myself a, a year to read a book from every country in the world. And this came out of a realisation that my reading to that point had been incredibly Anglo-centric. Uh, and it didn't really make much sense to me when I knew that there had to be many fabulous stories out there um, that I was shutting myself off from. And so that year, the 2012 year, which happened to be the year the Olympics came to the UK, was the year that I um, set myself this challenge to correct that cultural blind spot and see what voices I could access from around the world. Now, one thing that became very clear to me quickly was that the way that I had been trained to read as a literature student, I, at my first degree was in English literature, was not going to work when it came to reading literature from markedly different traditions and literature that had been translated from other languages. I had always been trained to read by understanding context, by doing biographical research around texts and understanding the sociological um, background to a lot of the books that I was reading and the nuances of all the words. But given the volume of reading that I was going to have to do um, and, uh, and this, the range of it, there simply wasn't the opportunity for that kind of uh, reading around. Um, I had 1.87 days for each of the texts that I covered that year and I had to find, read and then review those books on my blog, a year of reading the world .com. So realising this, I, I decided that I was going to have to take a different approach to the reading that year and embrace and not knowing, understanding that I wouldn't be able to appreciate all the nuances of the things that I encountered um, but trying nonetheless to have a meaningful engagement with those texts. And some of the techniques that I developed during that year involved embracing questions while I was reading, paying attention to knee-jerk reactions I had and understanding that often when something struck me as um, not working or, or bad or, or flawed in some way, it might reveal more about my own preconceptions and conditioning and biases than it did about the book. Um, and, uh, and paying attention to uh, the, 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 the fact that I was going to have to sometimes reevaluate my perspective and change uh, my understanding as a text uh, unfolded and perhaps educated me. Um, and this was a strange departure, really, because I think much of our Anglophone literary culture is based around um, imposing knowledge on things. Uh, for me, this condenses around the idea of the, the comprehension exercise that many of us will have done at school, where you're given an extract of text and ask questions about it. Uh, what does this word mean? Can you rewrite this sentence in other words? Um, what's going on here? And of course, that teaches lots of very useful skills, but there is uh, a problem in that it carries the implication that there is one ideal reading the text, and that if you can't explain everything in a, a book that you're reading, you're failing somehow. And much of Anglophone literary culture, reviewing culture, is about demonstrating cleverness, demonstrating wit. Um, many of the reviews we read showcase the intelligence and knowledge of the reviewer as much as they do uh, the book in question. And they can be incredibly informative and incredibly uh, valuable and fun to read. But when someone is encountering a text that is outside their familiar frame of reference, that breaks down and can lead to some serious problems. And I think when you're reading books in translation, as I did that year and as I have continued to do very intensively since then and correspond with writers and translators around the world and, and had the privilege to be involved in a number of different projects uh, around translated literature, it seems to me that there's a different approach that's required that centres around humility, a willingness uh, not to have all the answers and, and to learn and to reassess one's position. Um, now, obviously, that can be a challenge 
uh, when you're in a position of judging, because judging necessarily implies a sort of a powered position of superiority, um, making decisions about what's good and what's bad. Um, and I'm not saying that this means switching off critical judgment when you're reading a translated text, from, particularly from a language that you don't have uh, competence in when it comes to the source language. But I think um, there are I think there are things that you can be aware of uh, critically when you read translated literature. There are some translators who, who have made the case that if you can't speak uh, the original language, you have no business making judgments about a, a translated text. I don't think that's quite right. I think it is possible. Um, I think in Anglophone literary culture, we we don't yet have much of the language to um, to talk well about translated text. And that's something we need to work on developing but there are things that we can pay attention to things like how um, the text is framed extraneous material that goes along with it glossaries and footnotes uh, the very political issue of italicization and what's what that reveals about who the publisher imagines is reading and what they think that person knows and choices about how dialect is presented in a text uh, a brilliant example that often occurs to me is, is Sarah Arditsoni's translation of Faiz Again's Just Like Tomorrow where she brings a uh, very uh, gritty Parisian Arabic inflected uh, street slang into English uh, and turns it into multicultural uh, multicultural uh, London English uh, and she worked with a team of teenagers in order to do that and it works brilliantly that that translation not only into literally into English, but into another dialect that marries perfectly with the original. Um, and you can appreciate as you become more experienced in reading and judging and, and making and thinking critically about texts, you become more um, experienced in the sort of judgments that will have had to be made. But it is important always, I think, to bear in mind that you can't be certain at which point certain judgments or certain choices have been made, whether it's the choice of the original writer or the choice of the translator, if you haven't read the original text. Now, as the years have gone by, I've seen increasingly the value of being uh, alive to this, this uh, need to reassess and to not be rigid in one's position and to have a, a humility in approaching uh, works from elsewhere. Um, and it's been great to see a number of uh, very important discussions happening around the visibility of translators, most recently um, about the question of who should translate into which language and, and which direction translators should be translating into. And I think it's really interesting to see that the um, old assumption that translators should only translate into their mother tongue, uh, which prevailed for a long time in the Anglophone world, is breaking down. And that's that's opening up a lot of freedom um, in, in translation, which is very exciting. Uh, there's a brilliant collection that I wanted to mention called uh, an essay collection called Violent Phenomena, which was published this year by Tilted Excess Press. And it brings together 21 essays by different translators who um, challenge some of the prevailing colonial inflected assumptions that um, have uh, dominated uh, the way we treat texts from elsewhere. And it, it's a really valuable book to read for anyone who's interested in these questions. So I think to sum up really for me, this all this experience has um, taught me uh, that there is a great deal. You can have incredibly meaningful interactions with texts from elsewhere that are translated, even if you can't speak the original language. But to do so, you must, uh, or certainly I must, continue to be humble um, and to continue to question, to question not only the text, but myself and my own reading and what has led me to make certain judgments. It's about humility, curiosity, respect and readiness to be wrong. Thank you. Of things to unpack over there as well. I really like what you said about you know developing a language in English. Talk about translated literature because perhaps in the anglophone world we might not have that at the moment. And uh, you have brought up a lot of points that uh, could help in that. And uh, so I'm looking forward to get violent phenomena as well. The essay uh, collection that is uh, published by Total Access Press. And I will come back um, to talk more about this later. And now I'm going to give the floor to El Nathan John, our next speaker. Perhaps you could also share with us a little bit about your experiences, uh, your experience judging translated literature. 
Hi. Hi. Uh, it's it's really a pleasure talking about translation. It's one of the my favorite things to talk about. One because of the difficulty, but also because of the challenge, which which I think provides very unique um, um, unique fulfillment. One one once one has finished either reading a translation or judging a translation. And I come to translation both as an author whose works have been translated and as a person who has judged works in translation. Um, one of the quotes which I really like, which I, uh, you know, which, which had stuck with me for, for a few years is uh, that by George Steiner, wh wh which says that without translation, we would be living in provinces bordering on silence. And, and for me, this has always moved me because I, I think of writing and engaging with literature as a very political act, an act of defying silence, an act of entering into spaces where one's thoughts or, or stories may not be desired, but speaking nonetheless. And especially when one comes from cultures that have historically been obscured from view or, or undermined or even misrepresented, then it becomes even even more political that this silence be broken and for many of us who who write between cultures it is important that we do not have um corners where we have this kind of silence and this is where translation um uh, comes into play i i live in germany for example and i and, and while you know most of the literate population will understand some words of english most people are comfortable reading in their mother tongue and for that reason it's important for me as a person who lives here to have my work translated into german to have this silence you know whether it is deliberate or not broken by a person who has been invited into the world that i've created as an author and transmits this world beyond the provinces which i inhabit um and says you know there is this other narrative that exists outside of our own province and so a translation breaks breaks borders and, and and that's that's how i see it um with judging translation the difficulty of judging translation is tied to the difficulty of translation of translation itself and as i leave, live in germany i would I, I i will revert to quoting german philosophy where we have Wilhelm von uh, von Humboldt who who said that all translating is in fact an attempt to accomplish an an impossible task, and and this impossibility, I, I don't think has been has been overstated because even writing itself is a kind of translation is saying that I'm transporting people into a world of my own choosing, using language of my own choosing in a style that I may or may not have chosen, but which has chosen me. Um, and taking all of this, you know, to worlds far, be, far beyond uh, that which, 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 which I inhabit. And so um, uh, this difficulty for me makes all of the, the arguments, uh, some of which uh, Anne has mentioned, very interesting for me, like who can translate? Like, um, how do we translate? How do we... Um, tackle the, the difficult questions, um, especially when it comes to um, things like belief and ideology. Um, uh, Gregory Rabasa said that um, translation, uh, translation is difficult because there's little certainty uh, about what, what translators are doing. Um, and especially in an age where belief and ideology are important, um, it's, it's, it's even more crucial that um, this thank you is even more crucial that the translators get it right and that, that they do not misrepresent uh, meaning that because of how political writing is the translation must think of that political act and that failing in that act can itself lead to a failure in 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 the politics that is sought to 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 be trans to, uh, transmitted but there's also for me the beauty of translation the the enjoyment of being let into you know a space that that is sacred to the author that is full of 
of of not just work but blood sweat and tears and as a writer for me this is so important because i do this work and i know that when i finish writing a book for example the last thing i want to do is for somebody to take my words and, and misrepresent them which is why for me i think that translators are so so important not just on the level of 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 importance or utility but on the level of of, of style you know um as uh, suzanne sontag says um, um to speak of style for example is to speak of the totality of one's um uh, of, of work of art and and to every discourse about totalities must rely on metaphors and so i think of how do translators for example create their own matching metaphors because that's what they're doing um, because no metaphor can be perfectly rendered in a new language. It must rely upon the, 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 the cultural pillars of the new language to bring in that metaphor, which has been created in the original, to life in, in, in the new language. And so one must also think of the style of the translator. So the translator is not simply a work person. You know, a translator is not simply a person who does um, some sort of mechanical job. A translator is also an artist. The translator also works with metaphor, um, um, and and you know just as language is is the process of, of free creation, um, um, translation also is a process of, of of free creation. If if you think of the choices that a translator has to make on a word by word uh, basis, because there is not a single simple word when it comes to translation. Every word exists within certain borders and, and and parameters borders which are demolished by the translator and recreated in the new language um and so all translation is some kind of compromise you know both you know trying to be literal and and trying and important um and, and I probably will end this introduction with the, the very funny um, Italian uh, proverb about translation that says, translation, a translator traitor, um, which sort of highlights how important a translator is to a lot of damage while they're doing a lot of good. So I think that there's a whole range of things I, I, I look forward to, to discussing with this a really uh, amazing panel of, of writers, translators, and, and readers. Thank you so much, Andy. Then that was very elegantly put. And I'm so sorry, but I think we lost you a little bit um, towards the end. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, 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 that's totally fine. It's okay. We can talk about that later. Um, but I love what you said about translation defying silence and, you know, breaking down borders. And um, also translation is using a, tr a language of your own choosing. And also writing is also using a language of your own choosing. It's also like an act of translation. And I'd really like to talk more about that later. Um, but before we get to that, uh, perhaps let's uh, get to um, Mr. Kadamo Islam, who uh, would share with us as well his experiences uh, with uh, translated literature and judging translated literature. Hi, Kadamo. The floor is all yours. Karimo, we can't hear you. I'm afraid we can't hear you. Is there something wrong with your audio? Maybe we could go to Shash first. Would that be better or? Karimo? Could you try again? Hi. Um, I think we'll, I think we might go to Shash first, and then we'll come back to you if that's okay. Can you Can you hear me? Can you hear me say that? We still We still can't hear you. I'm afraid. Maybe we go to Shash first. Hi, Shash. Can you hear me? I can't hear Shash either. It's fine. I've. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Me now? Yeah. 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 Yes. Sorry about that. Sorry for. Uh, 
for, for about the audio just now. So, Shash, could you perhaps share with us a little bit about your experiences of uh, translating, uh, of charging translated literature and what your, your experiences in uh, literary translation? Sure. Thank you very much. Um, so, Anne and El Nathan have so eloquently talked about um, translation, um, the beauty of it and the difficulties. Um, as a translator myself, and as probably the only person who does poetry uh, on this panel, um, there are loads of different um, different constraints to, to translating poetry. Um, Anne was so right about the biases that a reader carries with them when they read translated work. And El Nathan was so right about a translator being a creator as well. I couldn't translate if I wasn't a poet. Um, for the last two years, I've been reading a lot of translated poetry, um, editing this um, new book, um, Out of Sri Lanka, which has been published by Blood Axe next year. Um, so we, the three, there are three of us, Vidyan Ravindra and Saini Sainavirtna and, and me, um, we're editing this book and we're looking at poetry from Sri Lanka and the diaspora from 1948 to 2021. Um, and that involves reading a lot of translated poetry from Tamil and translated poetry from Sinhala. Whereas I am the only one who can read Tamil, none of us can read Sinhala. So when we are judging the merits of the poems that we would like to include for these Sinhala poets who are so important to the country, um, we are basing our judgment only on the English text that's been presented to us. And this has raised a lot of um, important questions um, because the poetics of, of English and Sinhala or Tamil are completely different. How a poet writes in Tamil is different to how a poet would write in English. Um, just, just the units of poetry, so the lines, uh, where you break the line, is completely different between the two languages. The, um, the powerhouse of the words um, in English, you tend to get the, the, the engine of the line coming at the end of the line. In Tamil, it comes at the beginning of the line. Um, so when a translator doesn't take into account the two different poetic practices and uses one poetic practice in a different language, the translation doesn't work. And this is something we slowly came to understand as we read a lot of translated poetry. And it raised a lot of questions that, that Anne has raised already about our own preconceptions, because we're all trained in reading English poetry. That's what we did our degrees in. And like Anne, you know, that, that's what we, we've been conditioned. Um, and so the interesting questions that we had to do when, when judging which poems to include was, to what extent do we abandon um, a preconceived notion of what English poetry is? And to what extent do we marry the two poetics? Um, again, uh, just, just um, building on what El Nathan said about the translator's traitor, which I think hopefully by now has been put to rest because that's been going on since the 19th century. You know, it's time we moved away from that. Um, there is a certain um, adherence to literalness, which doesn't work in translation. And that's something I do look for. Um, and again, this comes down to the actual building blocks of a poem. And it's, it's pretty obvious if the wrong building blocks are being used in the wrong language. So these are the interesting things that came up. And, you know, I've learned a lot just by reading um, these two different um, sets of translations from two different languages. And it's changed a, a lot of the way I approach um, you know, looking at translated work. Um, and I also recommend the Tilted Axis um, anthology of, of essays, Violent Phenomena, because it, it, I mean, it, it, it breaks down 
um, and gives voice to those translators who are working between two mother tongues, maybe um, English and the, and their own sort of um, mother tongue, and breaking down um, sort of colonial notions of of what is what should be read. I think I'll stop there, but um, I'm looking forward to um, having a lovely discussion and learning a lot from from my esteemed panelists. Um, I think we've learned a lot from you too. Um, what you said about translating poetry and judging translating poetry uh, translations. So thank you so much for sharing with us that. And I like what you said about you know there are different poetic practices in different languages, and we really have to look into that when we are judging poetry, right? And then and also you also mentioned about what extent do we abandon our preconceptions when we when uh, when a judge is uh, judging a translated piece of literature. So I think uh, we might pick up that point later as well. So I was wondering whether if Kadamu could join us now. Oh, and, and, uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, yeah, very, very good. Very good. Uh, Fantastic. Fantastic. Make, yeah, the power of the sometimes deliver a shock to the, to the machinery, which, you know, just... Don't worry, Kadamu. Anyway, anyway, it's, totally anyway it's a pleasure to be in such company. And uh, I was wanting to begin with uh, translation uh, in Bangladesh. Um, it automatically means that uh, we have to talk about uh, Bengali, which occupies a very special position in the, in the nation's life. Um, uh, and so I need to give a little bit of history for you to understand, I guess, fully the, 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 the particular dimension of translation. All translation activities uh, in Bangladesh take place between Bengali and English. No other language is involved. Nobody translates into Hindi or Urdu or anything of that particular sort. Bangladesh, or what is currently Bangladesh, used to be uh, in colonial times East Bengal, uh, part of the greater Bengal region. Um, till uh, it was, uh, East Bengal was Muslim and rather backward compared to West Bengal, which was advanced, you know, cosmopolitan, metropolitan, the capital of the colonial uh, empire. And uh, when, uh, when the colonial rule ended, uh, Pakistan and India gained independence. And because we're on the basis of religion, the majority of Muslims formed Pakistan, so we became East Pakistan from East Bengal, while uh, West Bengal became part of India. So two, there, was a, there was a separation of, the, of, of Bengal into Muslim and Hindu. Um, and then it was, uh, since uh, East Bengal was laggard in education and literacy, mostly consisting of peasants, it took, we, we were always behind West Bengal. Um, there, it was during Pakistan time from 1947 to 1971 that English came into prominence because Pakistan did place uh, an emphasis upon English. In colonial times, English was rather the, you know, happened in West Bengal. Um, but what happened was that Pakistan also imposed Urdu as the national language. Um, and this aroused the fury of the Bengalis, who were extremely, extremely concerned that uh, their own language, Bengali, was going to be wiped out. Um, language now became a dominant political issue and finally led to the breakup of Pakistan. Uh, in 1971, there was a bitter civil war for nine months, and the original impetus and the driving force of that civil war, or the war of independence, as we like to call it, was the language, to preserve the language, that we can't have Urdu, we must have Bengali. And so when Bangladesh became independent, uh, Bengali was made, uh, the mother tongue achieved a dominance in all spheres of life that, that uh, did lead to a rather narrow linguistic nationalism. In that particular sense, English now was, uh, was, was uh, downrated. English medium schools, what we call English medium schools, where the language of instruction was of English, well now, you know, the whole thing went south. And uh, Bengali rose to the top. For 20 years, English medium schools and the teaching of English, and English generally took, uh, you know, a huge backseat to Bengali. And this has permanently scarred, I would say, that the use of English, the spread of English, uh, 
that till today we find the effects of. Though now, in the last 20 years, English has made, is making a comeback of sorts, but uh, especially in, the, in writing in English, in writing, uh, in, in attempting translations, there is that, that particular gap has not been covered, not, not yet. And so this is where English is now. I mean, it's slowly achieving a comeback, but it's, it's extremely slow. What has happened also is that uh, in Bangladesh, there's a three-tier education system. There's the state schools or the gov government schools, which are, you know, Bengali, and there's not English. Uh, then there's the madrasa, which is totally Islamic education. And then there are the private, uh, private schools, which are English medium. But this is extremely narrow based because it's expensive. It's very expensive to go to an English, to learn English in a developing economy like Bangladesh. Um, and uh, so what has happened is that, uh, is that unless you, you have a, you know, an adequate grasp of English, an adequate grasp of the target language, you're always going to be behind in translations. Uh, and translation into English is always going to be tied to the status of English in the country. And as long as the two are tied, then, you know, uh, there's going to be there's going to be particular problems in, in, in on the issue or on, in the field of English translations. Given that, uh, the interesting thing is that in West Bengal, in the other part of Bengal, since their particular since Bengali was not threatened in the same way or did not perceive a threat in, in that particular way, they just continued and they have the English integrations. And even if you know they had like three or four decades of communist rule. The communists never interfered with English. They never downplayed it. They allowed that particular system. So what you have is that the English in West Bengal is definitely, you know, has has, a, has had a much more easy life than in Bangladesh. Uh, this is very interesting because I'm always interested in 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 the in the Bengal in 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 the two Bengals of Bangladesh and West Bengal because we have a common language and. It's interesting to see that over the last 20, 25 years, differences have appeared uh, according to culture and society because we're Islamic, they're Hindu, in literary output, and this has affected translations in, in, in both the countries. And in, in the sense that they, have, they do have a more polished, I would say, a translation, while we, our particular translation status is much more amateur um, there are no specific guidelines. Everybody, it's translating into English is basically the hobby of English professors in academic in academia, and uh, but over there it's a little more. The only thing, and it it has it has generated as I read, it has generated interest in me in the languages of divided nations. For example, I have no idea what South Korea and North Korea are like, but have their languages grown a little separate? Over the years, do they translate each other? If they do, what are the particular difficulties? And this has come about purely from my own uh, situation, being in Bangladesh and looking across the border at their particular output and seeing the differences, uh, which is you know very illuminating. Um, the situation in terms of translation from English to Bengali though is far better in Bangladesh, mainly because there's a market for it, uh, and because the newspaper dailies do try to reprint. For example, articles in English in, in Western newspapers into Bengali. And so they fostered this particular community, mainly consisting of journalists, who translate from English to Bengali so that it can be printed. But their work is, you know, they have to meet deadlines and uh, and when they translate novels for the book fairs, it's, it's just, it, there are gaps, you know, standards are not, because they're, they're totally commercial. But still, that state is far more healthy than, uh, than, than from Bengali to English. Um, the English now, the teaching, the translation of English is basically an economic issue. It's expensive. It's expensive to go. So your parents have to have a certain amount of wealth. It's not like my generation when we, when we went to school, there were mission schools, there were missionary schools. I went to a Jesuit you know, school. And uh, compared to today, the cost was really nothing. 
and I learned my English and I learned uh, everything from the Jesuits, from the fathers, at a fraction of the cost of it. This has hampered, whereas from um, English to Bengali, the journalists, they need the money, so they do it. English, on the other hand, is a province of a narrow class elite, and that the children of those elite don't really need the money. And so you can, you can have the occasional translation from that set, and rather good, but they don't, you know, they do it at the request of a friend, or, you know, there's no sustained community of translations. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to get over that and uh, try and encourage. The bio that you read is slightly behind the times. Because of the COVID pandemic, we had closed the uh, Dhaka translation center. But it was interesting in the sense that we tried very hard, but we couldn't go beyond a certain level simply because we couldn't find people, you know, who had that, uh, who had the kind of English that real translation needs. I, I think I'm going to end here and then, you know, we can discuss further later on. Thank you. I'm so sorry, I'm so to, sorry hear that, to hear that, um, the, um, the, the, the efforts, efforts, you, you have to close down. down. I mean, you, 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 I'm yeah. so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm hearing, hearing an echo. echo. So I'm not so sure I'm why and, um, and uh, it's quite it's disruptive. Quite disruptive. So if, yeah. if um, someone could help me with that, that. because I'm still, because I'm still hearing, hearing myself. myself. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, um, okay, it's, 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 it's all right. It's all right. So, Anyway, I'm, anyway, I'm, just, I'm gonna just gonna wrap up what Karimo, Karimo just, said. just said. So, um, so um, you were saying that translation, because most of the speakers, most of the speakers before, quite disruptive, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. So, um, most of the speakers before you were talking about um, the problem of not knowing the source language and then judging translations based on that. But you brought up a really interesting point about um, the Taka language, which is English. You talked about translations being tied to the status of English, and you also shed some light on the translation politics in Bangladesh because of its history. So I, I like to touch on that. And I'm, I'm and just, I'm gonna just gonna open the floor, open the floor to, our to our four speakers, speakers now. Now, 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 you, you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not getting in the um, um, yeah. Hi, is Hi, everything, is better, everything now? better now? Yes, yes. I, yes. I, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. okay. All right. Um, All right. Um, so I have a question for the four speakers. Just now, um, Karimbo was saying that uh, was talking about language politics in Bangladesh and how the English spoken varies in different regions because of the country's history. And he and he some parts of Bangladesh speak English. Some more amateurish, and sometimes this affects the translation um, into English. So my question is. Um, to the four judges, um, to the four panelists here. When you look at a piece of translation, do you also consider where the translator is from and what influences their English? And perhaps how they use it to their advantage or disadvantage? Does this also come into play? Is there anyone who would like to answer the question? Yeah, um, if no one's taking it, I will yes, take a please. stab at it. Um, Thank you. Um, and forgive me if I don't understand the question, but I think the question is um, about where the person translating is from and what kind of English they speak. Is, is, is that correct? Yes, exactly. So I would like to know. Right. Yeah. When, when, when you're judging a piece of, of translation, does that also come into play? Because I know that judging translations can be yes. quite subjective. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is one um, issue I'm, I'm very interested in, especially having this weird legacy of, of colonialism, where we speak a language that has been forced on us. And uh, in many ways, I, I say to people, there are there's not one English. There are many Englishes. Um, and, and one must think of these Englishes as different languages uh, for one to understand the influences that come to the text from the translator. So, for example, there are things I would say in Nigerian English 
that that would convey a completely different meaning if I said it in, say, for example, Canadian English or in uh, English from from Ireland, for example, or or the US or uh, or, or the UK. Um, I, and and this is a function um, of of both culture, history, and and of power. You know who historically would you know was charged with saying that certain words are valid for use and certain other words are not, or certain ways of speaking are proper and belong to a certain class. You know, so it's also a function of of class. So there are many things that you think of, not just where the person's from. People never think of class in, in, in the ways in which people deploy language. And I always say to people, it's important, as is gender, for example, uh, very important, because we know that words don't, you know, come into use just, just by magic. They come into use through um, um, the actions of human beings. And we must think of the politics that leads to certain words being in popular use, whether it's a kind of politics that's driven by patriarchy or that that's driven by a certain kind of treatment of women or of minorities or of people of different backgrounds. All of these things, you know, come into play. And I think that it's a job of a translator to properly situate themselves in the larger scheme of things power-wise, politics-wise, and culture-wise, to say, what are my blind spots? What are the things that I I may need a little more effort to unpack? And, and in thinking of these potential blind spots, one is able to equip oneself better. But like Anne, I completely agree that um, um, these, this is not to limit certain people from doing translations. It is simply to say that when one takes a, a, a translation, you, one must think of the enormity of the, of, of the work from, from where one stands relative to the work, relative to language, relative to the power relations between the person and the text, the person and the other author, the person and society in general. And, and thinking of all of these things, I think, makes for a more solid translation, a translation that is, I think, cognizant of the power, but also the uh, danger of, of using and misusing language. If we look at politics, um, this is this is all the things that come into play when we talk about a piece of translated work. So as a judging panel, usually when 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 you're judging a piece of translator work, you have a judging panel. How how do all the judges on a judging panel ensure that the whole judging process is fair and square and everybody does not have too many of their preconceived notions um, in, 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 in the whole judging uh, process? Yes, Anne. Um, actually, I... I just before I t uh, address that, I just wanted to mention a really interesting um, novel that I think um, expands on this question of, of who's translating and what kind of English. Um, recently, I read a love novel by Ivana Sajko, um, who's a Croatian writer. It was translated into English by um, Mimo, uh, Mimo Simic. <laughs> and aha, and Al Nathan is very helpfully holding it up there. Um, and I was really struck reading this novel. It's an incredibly powerful account of a couple's uh, relationship sort of foundering um, amid extreme poverty and, and great pressures uh, in um, uh, the former Yugoslavia. And there's a real power to the language and the rhythms are very compelling. Reading it, I found myself thinking that there was the English was, all, uh, although com very much completely correct and um, within the bounds of what you know literary novels allow, um, there was a, a rhythm to it and a, a sort of slant to it that felt um, that it very much belonged to the place. And when I read the translator's note at the back, it became clear that she was translating not into English was a, a second language for her, and what mattered what put so much of the power into her translation, and I'm sure there was a lot of power in the original too, was that the story also belonged to her. She said, this is my story too. I lived this. And um, reading it, it took me a year to translate because um, reading it uh, was often like being punched in the gut by a family member. 
Um, and I found that really interesting because I thought, I wonder if, you know, an English, first language English speaker not from that region would have had that same ability to work with the text in the way, in that way. So I think it throws up all sorts of fascinating questions about what actually translating not just into different Englishes, but also from different vantage points um, can, can add, not just... Uh, is it okay or, or sh you know, how do we negotiate uh, the different kind of um, colours that different Englishes bring, but actually how, what can that actually add and how can that be richer than perhaps the more traditional translating into a more standard literary voice? Um, in terms of fairness on judging panels, I mean, I've, I've been involved in a few judging processes in, in my time and I think it is a challenge. Um, because people do bring their different we all no one can step entirely outside their own heads uh, i think we just have to try uh, as best we can to listen to all voices in the room and um again have that humility and respect that i was talking about earlier but that is often down to good chairing as well um and that that can be a crucial role thank you so much for sharing that does anybody else have anything to add if not oh yes shash you have something to say um Yep. Yes, I'm just marrying both the um, uh, what El Nathan was saying and what Anne said. I think uh, something that should be brought thought about is is the audience. Um, so who's it being translated for? And sometimes that helps with the judging process because there are lots of different Englishes. And like um, Cardamon was saying, there's so much of class and elitism in in sort of in Sri Lanka, as much as in uh, Bangladesh, by the sounds of it, um, that comes into being. And uh, I mean, we were finding a lot of um, English translations which were using very antiquated colonial style English, because that indicated that you had had an English medium education, therefore you belong to the, the elite section of society, which is all very well and relevant to Sri Lanka. But when you bring it over to, uh, say, Britain, which is what our, our, our audience is, is going to be in, in the West, um, we didn't want to perpetuate that sense of elitism. So I think that's something that should be borne in mind um, when translate when judging translations. Um, and I often think when when I've judged um, translations that it seems unfair when you when you judge something that's been translated with something that has been written in English in the first place, because the translated work carries so much of the baggage as we've all talked about. And the translator, I often think of as a bridge. Um, and if that bridge has been undermined by experiences, I mean, often translators, especially from um, previously colonized countries, have carried their own trauma. And so when they're translating works that also um, deal with cultural trauma or personal trauma or um, historical or even current trauma, um, they're having to negotiate their own trauma as they um, work with the author's all trauma and the book's trauma. And so they're bringing all of this stuff with them. Um, and it takes such a, a toll on, on the translator. And somehow I feel as if that should be taken into account when judging as well. So it's just really hard, isn't it, to have a level playing field, I often think. And I'm, I'm fascinated by how the process works. Yeah, me too. I, I think you've brought up a, a lot of important points and it's, it's really good that most judging panels have like four or five judges of different backgrounds. So everyone has their own perspective and then they can weigh in um, their own uh, different experiences. And also there is also a standard criteria which they judge a piece of translated work by as well. And I think, um, El Nathan, you, ha you have something to say just now, I think. You were... You raised your hand, I think. Oh no! I, so, yeah. so, I, so I think Anne said something which which reminded me of um, um, a quote by Paul Goodman that talked about the the style of the translator. That um, that the translator translator must have a style of their own. Otherwise, um, the translate the translation will have no rhythm or nuance. And I mean, with reference to um, her comments on love novel, um, you know how 
how the, how the translator transmits their own rhythm, their own style, you know, and 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 to this to this extent, you know, it being um, um, a craft. And like with everyone doing a craft, one must think of the same things that writers think of, which is to say, where am I relative to the people I'm speaking to, the people I'm speaking about, and the, the subjects I'm um, I'm tackling. And and one, once a, a person you know thinks of all of these things, um, I think that it, it's 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 harder to make big mistakes. But but I think that the, the last thing I wanted to say is that I think it is impossible to to be fair on a judging panel. This I don't even think of fairness because if you if you take five people and put them in a room, you know you have drastically limited the. <laughs> you know the, the the range of 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 thoughts you know about that book and one must think of prizes a bit i think a bit differently that that nothing is promised and if we think of that then we think okay within the subjective experiences of these five people you know how best can one um um show that one appreciates the work that one's reading how best can we show that we have shown respect for the author and respect for the translator and the work that they do and the work that they bring to the page and this i think is what a judging panel does because ideas of you know how can we be fair and how can we because what is fairness to me will not be fairness to another person the criteria with which i judge fairness is different from the criteria with which you judge others or like certain competitions for example where say for example we're in london and we have five people there, you know, somebody from India, somebody from Pakistan, somebody from from the UK, but we pretty much all sound alike, and we all have a certain kind of education, and we all belong to a certain class, and it's you know, it's not it's not really diverse, you know, and so when we think of of, of I, that's why I keep talking about class as as being important in in, in literature in general, not just um, you know where we come from. And, sorry, I, I'm rambling on and on. No, I, I, I get what you're saying. And thank you so much for sharing that. And on that note, I, I just want to um, pick up something I, I got from Anne's blog because I was looking at her website, which was very interesting. And uh, I think on the website, she did an interview and the interview with Daniel Han, who is the founder of the inaugural TA First Translation Prize. And this is where I quote him saying this about judging translations. So he said something like, if we are giving a prize for a translation, it should in theory, be possible to reward an awe-inspiring translation of a mediocre book above a good translation of a masterpiece. In practice, of course, it's not always easy to avoid being swayed by things that are seductive manifestations of the writer's skill, nor is it always realistic to think that as readers, we can accurately isolate different people's contributions anyway. This, this point about isolation is also about what you just said about different people's idea of what fairness is. So I was wondering if, if any one of you have thoughts about what um, Danny Hong just said in this particular interview, and you, if you have ever consciously or subconsciously tried to separate the translation from the original author, and how does it affect your appraisal of a piece of translation? And yes, Kadamo, I can see your hand. It's us. Okay. Um, I agree totally with Sars in the sense that when you're a judge, say, in like I was one in the Collins uh, short fiction uh, um, in a contest, uh, you have, you know, it, there's a fundamental uh, distance between somebody writing or what Nabokov said, the native illusionist, you know, he's got all the tools, he's got all the magic fractals flying, you can do anything, and the translator who is, uh, and the translator story which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of ring-fenced uh, with, with, uh, with all sorts of constrictions. And uh, I think one of the ways to do it is to be very aware and judge the story on itself before trying to judge the translation itself. It's on the second and third reading I find that the quality of the translation slowly comes into play. But unless, if it's a short story and everybody has, you know, contributed, it is it is wise to keep that translation thing out uh, at bay for some time before, you know, it'll come. The judgment on the translation will come. It has to. 
but uh, one has to be one has to be aware that there's a fundamental disconnect that there's a fundamental unfairness to it but you have to accept it and go on the other thing that i wanted to say is that in in judging uh, is that especially in the bengals between west bengal and and bangladesh uh, translations i'm increasingly getting interested in the question of slang because we are having a host of authors, younger ones, a younger generation, both here and over there, who are increasingly uh, using the urban area instead of the rural area as a setting for their novels and uh, their work, their fiction. And the amount of slang that is entering into, now Kolkata slang or West Bengal slang is very different. It's one of the very crucial differences between us and our slang, our use of slang, the very way we use slang, the slang words itself, the origin, the source, are just fundamentally different. And it is presenting a huge problem uh, in, in, in translation. In other words, it means that uh, in certain ways, I won't be able to translate uh, works from West Bengal authors, and they won't be able to, unless you know something, something happens, the slang words are becoming, a, the, the whole use of slang is becoming a very, very, very thorny issue. That's that's what I have to say. I'm wondering if wondering the other, if the other I'm wondering I'm if the other if judges, judges have. Um, and, and, do you think you can close your screen? Thank you very much, uh, Kenneral. Okay, I'm wondering if the other other judges have anything to say about uh, slang in a piece of uh, work, and especially how it is translated. Because I'm very sure uh, you've come across a lot of uh, translated fiction that involves slang. Yes, and please. earlier about dialect in some ways and, and different uses of English and it can be done incredibly well but it can also be done very jarringly. Um, I remember reading a novel once um, where uh, a, the translator had made the decision to try to represent different dialects um, by uh, substituting different um, British dialects and so you suddenly in the middle of a mountain range in another part of the world you had someone speaking a Yorkshire dialect um, which was very, very distracting and, and didn't work. And he had Yorkshire slang words in there. Um, and, and it just, it was very odd. Um, so it can, it can be done very well. It can be done poorly. As, as I mentioned before, um, Sarah Arditsoni's, I think is an exemplary example of, of someone who um, has, has done this really well in a way that complements and expands and enriches uh, that story. Um, and actually in terms of, going back to Daniel Hahn's comment about um, that there can be translations that are brilliant, even if not particularly uh, inspiring a source text. I mean, a classic example, of the, the source text is not is, is good, but Anthea Bell's translations of the Asterix books, for example, are often held up as um, examples of, of translations that improve upon the original and that are funnier, that are more engaging. Um, but of course, it's very difficult to know that if you haven't got access to the original text. Um, but slang, I think, is, is fascinating and, and it's part of what our language is. It's how, how we work. It tells us so much about people. So it's, it's really important that translators do find a way to get to grips with that, I think, if they're bringing a text across. Yes, thank you very much. So um, I would like to hear a little bit from Shaj about translating poetry actually um, because you, just now we were talking about like um, sometimes poetic traditions not sometimes actually a lot of times um, poetic tra uh, traditions in different countries are different and sometimes when a judge does not know the poetic tradition of a particular country it might affect his or her judging of the particular poem so as a poet and poetry translator yourself what is your poetry writing and translating process like are they different and does it come into play in your judging of poetry translations um yeah i i think it does come into play um just uh, so just to speak with examples so tamil lines poetic lines are very short so they're about five syllables a line um, English, obviously, you've got the iambic pentameters, you've got your ten, so that the, you're twice as long. But if a translator hasn't got a, his, their year turned to English, they're producing translations that are five syllables long. So you've got a very long, thin poem that takes several pages. Um, and this is when the line breaks come into play as well. You know, where do you break a line? You don't break a line on 
of that he, she, it. But in Tamil, you do. Um, so when judging uh, Tamil translations, I do want the translator to know where they're heading towards and who they're writing for. Are they writing for the Tamil audience back in Sri Lanka? Are they writing for a Western audience who are going to be reading the translation? Because translation should also always be about communication. And if you're failing to communicate the beauty of a poem because you're distracted by these weird line endings, <laughs> <laughs> and it really gets to me. I find that so awful. And and I don't know, it's just, it's one of my bugbears. And I'm thinking, please don't end it there. Please don't end it there. <laughs> just go on a bit more. Um, and so we've also been working with lots of translators, actually, just doing a lot of back and forth and, and talking. And then sometimes we're wrong and, and you want to end a line with just one word or have a one word line. Um, and sometimes they, they and it's a two-way process and we both learn and change. Um, but I think, I think you do need to be aware of who you're writing for as a translator. And this sort of comes into effects about um, being, being faithful to, to the original. Um, yeah, I could be very faithful to an original poem, which makes no sense in English because like we talk about slang or cultural references, you know, um, the sacred Bodhi tree and its spreading branches means nothing here unless I can stealth gloss it within my translation. Um, and so uh, that means that I'll be adding two or three lines to this poem, which isn't there in the original, but that's my choice. And I, as a poet, I don't want to produce a translation that isn't poetic in English. I want the translation to be beautiful as it is in the in the original. Um, so the situation in Sri Lanka being what it is, where the Tamil language is threatened to such an extent um, by a, a, a colonial government at the moment, the, the Sinhala government is a colonizing force. Um, so when translators approach Tamil, there is such a wish not to um, erase it further by diluting the Tamilness. But if the translation isn't done well with an ear to the audience, then they're not going to trans uh, tr communicate these important poems that of witness that are being written in Sri Lanka. And so it's a balancing act. You don't want to turn your back on the traditions of the of the culture you're translating from but at the same time you really want to make it a beautiful poem that people want to read in the in the in the target language so uh, yeah it's 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 hard yes it is it is hard <laughs> because you have to think about the audience, you have to think about the craft, you have to think about the author, and you have to think about retaining the beauty of the original language and carrying it over beautifully to the target language, yeah. which I think is really quite a difficult task. And Anne, I, I see your hand. You want yes. to add something? Yes. Um, yeah, just, just very briefly. I'm really interested by what Shash said about thinking about the audience. And I think she's absolutely right that that is an important consideration. Um, I think there's also, as she says, a balance to be struck about how much is explained and how much is left implicit. And what's been interesting in the last 10 years, I think, in, in British publishing, as we've seen, I, I believe, a, an increase, an increased readiness to trust the reader to be comfortable with a little more difference and a little less uh, being explained than was originally the case or traditionally the case um, but it's very political actually in terms of what is explained and what's left implicit because you are making a statement about who you believe is reading and if you're not careful you can actually exclude certain groups or, or imply that um, certain groups uh, knowledge is less you know less relevant by what you t what you choose to leave implicit or what you choose to explain so it's a real, a real, really skillful um, thing that has to be thought about very carefully. I had a very interesting discussion some years ago with an Indian publisher about this question of italicization and um, how they'd moved away 
uh, from italicizing English uh, Indian language terms in English language texts in India because the hangover there was that they were writing for a British reader if they were italicizing these foreign words which actually weren't foreign for Indian readers in English and for me that's quite a, a neat example of that what do you explain and what do you what do you leave um, for the reader to work out or to, to sit with yeah um, so can we have um, El Nathan and then later Cardamore because I saw El Nathan's hand yes, um, yes. I, I'm, re I'm really pleased that, that Shash is here to talk about uh, translating translating poetry um i mean i think it's it's voltaire that famously said you know it's impossible to translate poetry and he says uh can you translate music um and, and i one of the, the authors i think of is uh, jean joseph rabiari velo who is a, Mad a poet a, a poet from madagascar and he died a very long time ago and one of the earliest books of poetry I ever read was uh, Translations from the Night by Jean-Joseph Rabiari Velo. And these were poems that were translated from both in, um, in Malagasy and French into English. And if we know the works of Jean-Joseph Rabiari Velo, he had a lot of uh, rhyme and, and, and iambic pentameters, which the the translators sought to, to preserve. And and so I think of the, the, the original poems, for example, in French or Malagasy, and, and how difficult it was. It was a book I, 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 I read for such a long time because the, the, the book has translations on the left and, and um, translations on the right and, and the original on the left. And so, for example, just as an example, there's a poem of his called Postlude. And the first paragraph, one of my favorite poems in the book, he says, uh, memory, memory, autumn of my heart, what bird will sing in woods deserted grown and what bright burst of flowers soothe the smart where we are exiled, but kings but overthrown and so that last word you know as Shash was talking about so the, the, the rhyme between grown and overthrown and I was thinking goodness god how is how is this possible and in, in French instead you know he, he changes instead of um uh, uh, the words désolé you know he translates instead the word grown so that it would rhyme with overgrown instead of the word exilé which is the original word in French and so in French is désolé, exilé, and then in English he chooses grown and overgrown and completely changing the structure of the of the poem, preserving the, the rhyming scheme. And so, of course, the question then is, what is lost and what is gained? There is a new poem, obviously, and in English I, I, I can see the rhythm and the nuance, you know, I can see the beauty, I can see all of the, 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 the meter, you know, you know, what is gained and what is lost. And this is why translation is such, is such, as in the words of Ursula Le Guin, is an entirely mysterious thing, translation. I have to agree with what El Nathan said, because I recently also read a really great translation from Wong Mei, a Singaporean poet, who translated um, some Tang poetry into English. And it was amazing. She gave uh, the poems a new shape and a new form. And they were all so poetic and so beautiful and still retain the melancholy of uh, some of the poems. So before we wrap up this session and go to the Q&A segment, I would like to hear what Cardamo has to say because I think you have some comments as well. Issue of trans creation, which is something that started uh, by Professor P. Lal in, in Calcutta. And when he said that the translation need not be, you know, literal word for word, and in a lot of the previous translations done um, in Bangladesh, the literal word for word translations did not work because it became very stilted. And you know, I think somebody used the word antique, and it, it doesn't. And so I'm I'm looking at this particular translation where you evoke the feeling and the mood without being literally word for word. And this is what I'm trying to spread the word around. Uh, transcription used to be a very fertile activity in India until English came and you know overturned the rules and because of the cultural social political hegemony of English until today I'm still obsessed I still worry and I wonder about whether a translated text because it is in English gains more prominence more power than the original text 
you know, the hegemony is still operative, still going ongoing. So how do we break it? How do we bring a democratic balance between the translated text and the original? Or is the original going to get submerged as everybody gets excited about the translated ones and the translator gains more prominence than the author? I haven't figured it out. I'm just merely asking the question to myself. That's all I have. Thank you so much, Carnival. Yes, um, I think that's a very interesting point that you brought up as well about the politics of, tr of translation. Um, perhaps we could come back to that again later because now I think uh, we might want to move on to the Q&A segment because I think we have quite a number of questions from our audience who are very, very um, delighted and, and enthusiastic about you know getting some answers from uh, our for honorable esteemed panelists. So we'll now move on to the Q&A segment. And if you have a question, please send it in via the comments section on the Facebook Live page. So now I see a question from um, Tun Mong. And he said he would like to ask this. What five most important criteria would you set for judging a piece of translation from the standpoint of a referee or from the standpoint of a judge, what are the five most important criteria? Anybody? Is this if we don't know the host language, the ta the source language? Um, um, Tun, would you like? Because that's. And so maybe without knowing the source language, yeah. we'll talk about without knowing the source language first. Yep. Yes, Shash, you would like to answer the question? I think the most important thing I would look for is um, communication, whether I can follow um, it, when I'm reading it, whether it makes sense to me um, artistically, not knowing the source language, but as a translated piece of work is its own creative piece of work. So I'll judge it on that. Mm -hmm. And what if you know the source language? Um, well, I'm not a big fan of being literal. Um, so even with that, I would see what the translator has done to make. Um, I think communication is the most important thing I look for. So I could appreciate both. And if the, the translation fails in communicating, what the source language is saying, then yeah, that I wouldn't um, put it forward. Okay, and anybody else? Anne. Yes, um, I I think it's also important to take into account uh, the where the book is coming from or written from and how how commonly we see such narratives how whether this is a a voice that is is not often represented that is important to consider and the challenges much as shash mentioned earlier of that have been involved in bringing that text across it's not always possible to know that um but as far as possible to have some sensitivity to uh the barriers that have been crossed in order to bring this text into what is the most published language and at the point that Cardamal was making that English there is a huge imbalance not just in terms of whether a translation gets prominence but because it is the most published language and because books published in and translated into English not only have access to a massive global readership the most spoken language in the world when you take into account second language speakers but also have a much higher chance of being translated into other languages. So when you bear all those those things in mind, it's really important, I think, to take into account texts that will have had more challenges, more more barriers um, when you're trying to consider that. Um, El Nathan. Yes. Um, so. I think Shash mentioned the first thing I would think of, which is, of course, in general, fidelity to the text. But I would look at another thing, which I think David Pye talked about, which is um, soundness and comeliness, which is soundness being close to the first thing that, that, that Shash said, which is that have, has the translator um, moved toward or averted all of the things that the original 
text was moving toward and was trying to avert. And for comeliness would be, has the translator applied their own style that brings the style of the author into a new language in ways that are not just a, a sort of uh, a piecemeal imitation of the text, but one that shows that the translator is grounded in their craft, is the translator is themselves an artist, and the translator is bold enough to apply their own style and their own way of thinking of language to 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 the to the translation tra translated text. So these are the things that I would add um, to, you know, what I would look for in a in a translated text. Thank you very much, Nathan and Kadamar. I mean, people forget that English has a rhythm. I look for rhythm. Uh, perhaps, you know, as a result of being of uh, having endured many a stilted translation in the past, that when when English is properly written, it has a cadence and a rhythm, and I I really look for that. And this is interesting in terms of the fact that lately, over the past decade, um, is the diaspora, the Bengali diaspora, that has been uh, you know doing the best translations because they live in an English environment, because they're communicating English in a different way. Um, their, their particular translations are outstripping the ones we do at home, simply because that they're tuned into the rhythm of English. And without this rhythm, without this natural rhythm, if it's missing, I find it hard going. It's a very hard road to home. So even when judging after some time, what attracts me is, 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 is the flow. The, the particular rhythm, and then the other pieces come into, uh, you know, fall into place. I feel yeah, like, I feel um, like uh, as a person as who a person wants to submit um, poetry to be judged or like submit translations to be judged, those are the things that I have to look for and I have to bear in mind. So we have a question from Emily. Uh, she asked, is a translation better as a translation if it's more interesting than the original? So she often sees people lamenting boring translations or cliches in the source language. But if the source is cliche, wouldn't it make sense for the translation to be cliche as well? At what point are you misrepresenting what the author is doing? Does anyone want to answer this question? Okay, um, oh, Nathan. So, one of the things I think of, and this is, a, it's a very interesting question. One of the things I think of is something that John Hookman said, that, that the language of translation ought never to attract attention to itself. I think of this when I see translations that are not, that do not avert their mind to the constraints of the original where you see the translator sort of winging it and just like going on their own tangent. And it's like, it's like doing tango, but like doing it alone. And, and it, it really is like tango, you know, the, the, the relationship between a translator and, 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 and an author. And if you dance alone, every, if, you know, tango is beautiful because two people are dancing in sync. And if the translator is not sort of dancing in sync with the author, then this disparity becomes so obvious that the translator is doing their own thing and taking liberties in ways that highlight the translator to the detriment of the original. And I think that a translator must be aware of their position in the scheme of things, that although they're an artist, although they bring their own style and rhythm and nuance to the piece, they are doing a dance with the author. And so a translator, I think, can avoid this kind of extreme disparity where you, you see the translator as such a separate entity from the author, even though they are. And, and so that's why I bring come back to that quote that the language of translation ought never to attract attention to itself. And that's the job of a good translator. In the same way as when I teach writing, for example, I say that, that the language by itself, you know, is, is a tool for the ideas. And that while the language can be beautiful, if the language is beautiful at the expense of the ideas, then it is not a beautiful text. It is simply a text that's showing off. 
And so I think it's a delicate balance. It's a, it's a, it's a fine line to tread to say, I will bring my own style. I will bring my nuance. I will treat this as a work of art, but I will not dance alone. You have just answered is actually very relevant to Shahat's question, who says that, and this is a question that he he poses especially to you. He said that you stated that a translator is also an artist and creator. Doesn't this simply imply being unfaithful to the source and um, to be a true artist? And would that affect the later judgment of the text? I'd like to combine this question with another question from Heather, who said that how do you balance the style of the translator with the intentions of the author? And I'd like to open up this question to other panelists as well. How do you balance the style of the translator with the intentions of the author? Hi, Shash, please. Um, um, building on what El Nathan was saying and also answering your questions now, um, I think when I translate, you enter the text, but you have to make it your own in order to disappear from the translated work. And sometimes I think the best translations I've read are ones where I forget it's a translation because I can't hear the translator. But in order to not hear the translator, the translator has to make it their own completely. And that means entering the words themselves and making it their own. You keep in mind the, 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 the original author, but it's got to be your own words that come through and your own voice. Although it's not your own thoughts, the thoughts are the original authors. And that way you can then disappear in the final product and the reader is left thinking I am reading a book by the original author and they forget the translator and I think that is what I would love somebody reading something I translate that I'd like them to think this has been written by Cherin or um, um, Latha for, um, you know Tamil poets and they don't remember my name because I've done my job We we'll wrap up the session. Would anybody else um, have anything to add to the question? If not, I have a last question from Jitan. Um, this is actually for Anne, who mentions the importance of a chair in the judging process. Could you please tell us why? Yes, well, I think essentially, as, as Christina has given a good demonstration of today, um, it's important to try and allow all the voices to speak and to allow space for everyone to speak. Um, we haven't had any violent disagreements today, but I have been in rooms where there have been uh, disagreements between speakers. And sometimes the person with the loudest voice can carry the day. Um, so in those situations, it's up to the chair to try and find a way of balancing the views and reflecting back what people are saying can be a very valuable way of doing that um, so that everyone around the table can appreciate the viewpoints being put, even if one viewpoint is being put more strenuously or more vehemently than another. Um, so it's, it's a fine art and, it, and one that's difficult to get right, um, but uh, essentially allowing, trying to create space so that everyone is equally heard. I think that's really what I mean. Thank you so much, Anne. And on that note, may I ask again if any of our panelists would like to add um, anything about the judging of translated literature being equally heard? Yes, our Nathan. I, I just wanted to, to quip that sometimes a bit of disagreement is fine, a bit of fighting <laughs> can add to the to the drama, you know. Sometimes I get bored and I want to fall asleep, I'm like, oh God, there's too much agreement in this room. <laughs> um, and often lively debate produces the most um, results, I think. Um, and and I'm, I'm often suspicious of rooms where everyone's agreeing. Um, um, 
and just because of this, I will maybe slightly differ from Islam when he talked about um, <laughs> uh, the, the, the rhythm and cadence of English. I don't think there's any such thing as the rhythm and cadence of English. Um, I think that it, it it sort of leans too much for me towards some kind of orthodoxy that that English has something that you can discern as, as this is the rhythm of English. I think that in, it, for some of us who have challenged um, 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 powers that have determined what is right and what is wrong. So I come from Nigeria, for example, and we grew up hearing that there is a way that we must speak English. There is a way that we must pronounce words. There are slangs that we should not use. There's a rhythm that you must apply when speaking to a certain person. And so we all mimicked all of these rhythms and we came to know these as the rhythms of English. But in fact, I'm lucky also to be alive at a time when 20 year olds are saying, actually, we don't care about the orthodoxy. We are creating a rhythm of our own. We know that the rhythms that we hear now are the sounds sometimes of the people who are our oppressors, are the sounds of the people who told us to stand in line in school. The men who told the women that no, that's not like that's that's a that's a bad way to, to speak. Don't raise your voice in that manner. Or that's too feminine for men who are who are who are in this sort of heteronormative mold. Oh no, that's that's not masculine enough. You know, and 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 all of these things come into play. And when I say I, I, I rebel against the any idea of orthodoxy in English, especially in English because of its colonial history. And the last thing I'll say is I think of Dambuzo Maracera, who said the English language is very male, it's very sexist, and to make English work, one must have harrowing duels with the language. And this may mean discarding rules of grammar, discarding syntax. Put, forcing English into these torture chambers so that we rid it of all of the influences of language, of culture, of history that have made English what it is today. And we say to English, we will make you do what we want you to do, not what you've told us to do. With it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anu, then. That was really great. And I wish we could talk more about this. Perhaps the Singapore Book Council can have a panel on this as well, because I think there's lots to discuss about this. But we have come to the end of today's session. And thank you to all our speakers. Thank you so much and all participants for joining us here today. And I hope you can help us improve our sessions. Scan the QR code on your screen and fill out the feedback form. If you would like to rewatch this session and other sessions at the symposium, the videos will be available at the Singapore Book Council Facebook page. If you're interested in literary translation, do look out for the literary translation workshop organized by Singapore Book Council. You may scan the QR code to find out more. And a big thank you once again to all participants who have joined us both in person and virtually this year. We hope you have enjoyed the Translation Symposium and see you again next year for more exciting programs. Connect with us to find out more about Singapore Book Council's programs. And once again, I'm Christina Ong. Thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.